troops moving along the Warrington Turnpike here. Jackson's men are up here, and then he moves them down to confront the Union troops moving along the road, unsuspecting, not realizing that Jackson is even there. As Jackson's artillery opens on the Union column, which probably gave them some idea, <laughs> King, who was an epileptic, has a seizure. And it's the second epileptic seizure he's had in a week. He is out of commission. Without a leader, and thinking that it's probably just cavalry, still not realizing they're fast, they are facing half of Robert E. Lee's army, Brigadier General John Gibbon acts on his own authority and he leads his brigade off the Warrington Turnpike and north through the fields and woods of John Bronner's farm. That's what you see here. Gibbon's brigade moving off the road to confront the threat in front of them. The resulting clash hits Gibbon's men, the second 6th and 7th Wisconsin and 19th Indiana, soon to become known in history as the Iron Brigade, against another storied Confederate unit, the Stonewall Brigade, men raised in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, in a bloody stalemate, featuring some of the most intense musketry fire of any of those men had ever seen, and morphing into what John Gibbon described as a long and continuous roll. It was a brutal contest of wills, with firing at distances of 80 yards or less. Neither side giving ground. They just stood there and fired away with the, at each other with 58 caliber weapons. The fighting will continue for two hours into the darkness, with men on both sides firing only at the musket flashes of the enemy. Private George Fairfield of the 7th Wisconsin wrote this about the, about the fight. My God, what a slaughter. No one seemed to know the object of the fight. There we stood for an hour or more, the men falling all around me. We had no orders to fall back, and Wisconsin men would rather die than fall back without orders. And die they did. In two hours, one out of every three men on that field will be shot. 2,300 casualties total on both sides in about two hours' time. Now Jackson in this fight achieved what you had hoped, at least in part, and that is he sent a signal to Union General John Pope, the equivalent of waving a red flag or a red cape in front of a bull, and that is, here I am, come and get me. And that's exactly what Pope is going to do. This is the, uh, the second Manassas battlefield, similar to the last map I showed you. This is Henry House Hill, where the visitor center is today. You probably, most of you are familiar with the old stone house down here at the intersection of the turnpike and the Sudley Road. Pope is going to arrive at the battlefield from Centerville and set up his headquarters in this area here. He is focused on Stonewall Jackson. That is his total focus, is catching Jackson and destroying his half of the army before the other half of the Confederate army can get there. So he issues a spate of orders that night aimed at attacking Jackson before he can get away. His plan is to use frontal assaults to hold Jackson in place, while General Fitzjohn Porter's V Corps and Urban McDowell's II Corps, about 20,000 men, move around and hit Jackson's exposed flank. So two Union Corps are going to move around this way and attack Jackson from here while he's kept busy with frontal assaults by the rest of the Union of, of uh, Pope's men, Union Army. Now, this pincer movement, or this flag attack plan, is based on a couple of wrong assumptions. The first wrong assumption is that Stonewall Jackson's Confederates are retreating, or about to retreat, and get away. They have no intention of retreat. They're very happy to stay there in their very strong defensive position. The other, more dangerous assumption is that Longstreet's half of the Confederate Army is still 24 to 36 hours away and can provide no support. He is fixated on destroying Jackson and is not paying attention to what Longstreet is doing. Meanwhile, on the 28th, Longstreet's wing, along with Robert E. Lee, the Army commander, has pushed aside the Union resistance at Thoroughfare Gap, the same route that Jackson took, and at dawn on the 29th, 
They are pressing on to rejoin Jackson just a few miles away. General John Pope is blissfully unaware that any of this is going on. And so early on the morning of August 29th, Jackson moves his men forward and deploys them for one and a half miles along the cuts and fills of an unfinished railroad, which provides excellent protection. Despite his losses from the day before, Jackson is confident that his men will hold, and he knows that Longstreet is close at hand if he needs the help. And so, at about 7 o'clock in the morning, the first of four massive but disjointed and piecemeal Union assaults hits the left and center of Stonewall Jackson's line. And for five hours that morning, Union divisions, one after another, try unsuccessfully to break Jackson's line. But the attacks aren't well coordinated. They don't go together in a large mass. They go together a brigade or at most a division at a time. And Jackson is able to move troops to prevent a breakthrough of the line. Fighting is at times muzzle to muzzle and hand to hand, with men clubbing each other, sometimes with empty muskets. Said one soldier, often the combatants delivered their fire within a dozen paces. The slaughter was too horrible and sickening. But what about the other key part of Pope's plan, that attack on Jackson's flank? Well, at about 11 o'clock in the morning, as these attacks are going forward against the railroad, the unfinished railroad, Fitzjohn Porter and Urban McDowell, the two corps, have been moving north. They're clear down here. The fighting's going on up here. They're way down at the bottom of the battlefield here, and they're headed in the right direction. They're moving this way, and they're going to go into Jackson's rear. But now, as you can see, there's a lot more men, Confederates, on the battlefield. The red lines are Confederate troops. They get a confusing order called the, uh, the joint order that Pope has sent them, and they are now trying to figure out what it means. But the wording is so confusing and contradictory that they can't decide whether they're supposed to continue the advance or retreat or hold their position. While they're trying to figure out what they should do and how to interpret this order, uh, Cavalryman John Buford, a uh, Union cavalry officer, comes to them and reports that he has sighted a huge enemy force approaching from the direction in which they are going. 17, 17 regimental flags arriving and deploying just ahead of them. It's Longstreet. Quick question? Yes. Yes. You talked about corps and regiments. I talked about corps and regiments. What's the size? Thank you. Very good. Uh, a corps in the, uh, a, oh, let's, let's start with a regiment. A regiment on, on each side is about the same. At the beginning of the war, a regiment will have a thousand men. But as the war went on, because of attrition, those numbers go down. So probably at Second Manassas, you're looking at somewhere between 350 and 450 men in a regiment. That, that's the one of the smallest level units. The Corps is the largest level unit at the other end, and a Union Corps will have about nine to 12,000 men in it. At this time, the Confederate Army has not established the Corps system, so the infantry is divided into two halves of about 25,000 each. So a Corps will be, say, roughly 10,000 men in the Union Army. So two Union Corps down here will be about 20,000 men. But what they're approaching is half the Confederate Army. Now, faced with, um, with these developments, McDowell moves away. He just says, I'm not going in that direction. McDowell turns around and heads back, and he's going to rejoin Porter eventually. I'm sorry, he's going to rejoin Pope eventually up here. Porter just stops to await new orders. So, as you can see, the flanking attack that Pope keeps expecting is going to happen isn't going to happen. And amazingly, nobody thinks to tell Pope that the attack isn't happening. And oh, by the way, Longstreet with the other half of the Confederate Army is now on the field. They forget to mention that to Pope. Well, as you might expect, now with his full army on the field, Robert E. Lee wants an immediate attack. He wants to launch an attack right away and get this over with. But Longstreet, whose corps has produced, whose wing, whose half of the army has just come up, urges him to, to wait and to check out, to make sure. He's not sure how many men Porter's got with him. 
So he urges Lee not to make the attack right away, but to reconnoiter or scout the area to make sure they aren't getting into something that they aren't, uh, aren't comfortable with. So the attack is delayed, and that will happen several times as the Confederates continue to try to determine where the Union units are and when is the best time to make this attack. Meanwhile, John Pope, totally unaware that now the Confederate Army is all together on the battlefield and still expecting this flank attack at any time from two Union Corps, orders more frontal assaults, basically suicide missions if you will, to hold Jackson's attention until the flanking attack can be made. And so, from about 3 o'clock until 6 o'clock in the afternoon, three more successive piecemeal and unsuccessful Union attacks hit Jackson's line. Fighting is often hand-to-hand -hand with bayonets, but again, Jackson's line holds. And that's what you see, and that's what you see going on here. So again, no attack is going to be made because they can't get through all the new Confederates that have arrived on the battlefield. Pope doesn't know that. He's here in his headquarters, and so he just keeps launching attacks against the railroad. Finally, sunset puts an end to the fighting for this day. McDowell finally rejoins Pope and belatedly reports, oh, by the way, Longstreet with the rest of the Confederate Army is on the battlefield. Now, Pope, incredibly, continues to be convinced that Longstreet is only there to support um, Jackson long enough for both of them to retreat. Pope is fixated on this idea that the Confederates are going to get away, and I need to attack them fast enough to prevent that from happening. But he's also furious with Fitzjohn Porter. Here's Pope on the, on the left, Fitzjohn Porter on the right. Uh, Porter is ordered to rejoin the army at Pope during the night. And uh, Pope, not aware that there are a combination of his confusing orders and Longstreet's arrival on the battlefield, have wisely caused uh, uh, Porter not to make the attack that he was supposed to attack, and assumes that he is either incompetent at best or traitorous at worst. Well, where is George McClellan? Remember, he's got an army too, and he's supposedly moving back toward Washington, and then is supposed to reunite his army, or unite his army with Pope's army. Well, he's back in the Washington area, all right, but his extreme caution and his dislike for Pope overwhelmed any urging that Lincoln made to ride to Pope's aid telling the president it might be better, quote, to leave Pope to get out of his strength, and at once use all means to make the capital perfectly safe. And therefore, if most of McClellan's army is going to be focused on protecting the capital, against which there is no threat, rather than going to the aid of John Pope, who's right in the middle of the battle with the Confederate army. So we move on now to the second and climactic day of the Battle of Second Manassas, or Second Bull Run, the 30th of August, 1862. It dawned hot, dry, and quiet. Not unlike today. <laughs> At least the hot and dry part. There is no action during the morning as both commanders are trying to figure out who's going to do what next. Lee is content to wait to allow to see if Pope is going to attack him, which would then give Lee a an opportunity to counterattack. Pope has finally been convinced by scouts that the rebels are still on the field. They aren't retreating as he had continued to imagine, but he sees no reason not to launch an attack and, quote, thrash the traitors. So he orders Porter to launch an attack. Yes, the man he called a traitor is now going to launch another attack against the center of Jackson's line at Groveton, north of the turnpike. He continues to ignore the fact that Longstreet and 30,000 men are even on the battlefield to represent any kind of a threat, even though he's been told this several times. He even wires Washington, reporting the enemy has been driven from the field and stating his expectation that a glorious victory is at hand. Something about counting your chickens. Anyway. At 3 p.m., Porter launches his main corps assault, stretching for a mile into a hail of rifle and artillery fire. So here's Porter's 
Union assault. Again, focused on Jackson's line along the railroad cut, totally ignoring the 25 to 30,000 men here under Longstreet. In desperate close quarters fighting that ensued along the railroad bank, there you see the attack through open terrain. And at certain points, this has become a, a very famous incident, but we're pretty sure that it did happen. It just wasn't terribly um, pivotal to the, uh, to the fight, but it is dramatic. As the Confederates were running out of ammunition and waiting for more to come and for reinforcements, some of them actually started throwing rocks at the Yankees, uh, some of whom threw them back. <laughs> Remember one New Yorker. The shouts and yells from both sides were indescribably savage. It is scary too much to say that we were really transformed from the time from a lot of good-natured boys to the most bloodthirsty demons. By 3.20, after only 20 minutes of this, Jackson's line is at risk of collapsing, and he sends a request to Lee for reinforcements. And what follows is arguably one of the most effective Confederate artillery assaults in the entire war. Longstreet opens up on the, on the flank, uh, from the side, against these attacking Union troops across this open field with 30 artillery pieces. They can't miss. Without support, the Union attack collapses after suffering 3,000 casualties in about a half an hour. That's half of the attacking force. Finally, Longstreet is ready to make the attack that Lee has hoped he would be able to make since yesterday. And at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, he launches 25,000 soldiers, probably close to one of the largest mass infantry assaults of the entire Civil War, against his old West Point roommate. That's what you see here. And as you can see, Pope has obliged by moving most of his army north of, here's the turnpike. He's moved no, most of his army, all the blue lines, north of the turnpike, so there's very little opposition to Longstreet's attack. That's okay because Longstreet wants to get in the rear and block the Union Army from retreating. And once they're caught between Longstreet and Jackson, they'll finish off Pope's army. Well, the spearhead of the attack is Hood's Texas Brigade. And the first of the few, only about 2,000 federal troops, are in the way, so to speak. And the first of those is uh, Colonel Gunther Warren's brigade, most, uh, two, composed of two New York regiments, the 5th and the 10th Zuons, about 1,000 men, about 530 each, two regiments. Uh, and as you can see, they're uh, dressed in what we would consider to be non-regulation uniforms, but they are regulation uniforms at this time. The Zuons were, uh, units were patterned after the French Army, uh, North African units that wore red pantaloons and blue jackets with fezes. Um, they make great targets. <laughs> Private Andrew Coates of the 5th New York later remembered, for a short time, the regiment tried to fight back the overwhelming force that was pouring in a fearful stream of death and destruction upon it. But the stream became a torrent as the right and left flanks of the enemy almost surrounded us. War has been designated as hell, and I can assure you that where the regiment stood that day was the very vortex of hell. Not only were men wounded or killed, they were riddled. In 10 minutes, the 5th New York will lose 332 men including 121 killed out of a total of 525 men. It's more battle deaths in a single engagement than any other Union regiment in the entire war. 332 men in 10 minutes. Union brigades from Ohio and Massachusetts will make brief heroic stands on Chin Ridge, which will slow down Longstreet's advance, buying precious time but at a fearful cost. Finally, at about 6 o'clock in the evening, Pope begins to realize 
the terrible miscalculations that he's made, and he acts quickly to try to save his army. He managed to cobble together a defense of, um, of strategic high ground near Henry, Henry Hill. So now the two armies are right back to exactly where they finished the first battle of Manassas the year before. As you can see, the blue Union lines trying to hold off the massed Confederate attacks. They use the, the, natural, uh, the natural trench created by uh, the Sudley Road, Road 234, um, the high banks on the sides of the roads is kind of a ready-made natural trench. And uh, the combination of this stiff resistance and uh, sunset finally brings an end to the fighting. About 8 o'clock, in the darkness, Hope orders a general retreat. This time it's an orderly one, as opposed to the mass panic uh, by the Union Army after the first battle of Manassas the year before. Most units take the turnpike and cross Bull Run using the wood-repaired stone bridge to reach the relative safety of the fortifications at Centerville. And there, they join up with the lead elements of McClellan's army, who's finally arrived, just in time not to be able to help. <laughs> Something they probably should have done a week earlier. And so, the Civil War has returned to Fairfax County. The next morning, the 31st of August, Pope's defeated army moves out of Centerville along the Warrenton Turnpike, that's Route 29, modern Route 29, toward Fairfax Courthouse, and then beyond that, eventually to the safety of the Washington defenses. But they aren't quite there yet. That same morning, Robert E. Lee isn't ready to give up the fight. He sends Stonewall Jackson on yet another end run. So you have to begin to ask yourself, whose wing would you rather be in, Jackson's or Longstreet's? Because Jackson keeps getting the job of doing all this heavy marching and then fight. And so he does. He goes straight north from the Manassas battlefield on the Gun Spring Road. And where it intersects with modern day Route 50, he makes a right hand turn. And now he's heading east toward Fairfax. Now his target, his target is the junction of the two roads here in what known then as Germantown, probably Camp Washington now, just, just west of, of the town of Fairfax, this area right here, where the Warrington Turnpike, that's the road on which Pope's army is retreating from Centerville and trying to get this way and this way back to Washington. Jackson's men come up here and down along this way to try to get beat them to the intersection and cut off the retreat. Lee's still interested in destroying Pope's army if he can do it. Jackson's men are exhausted from all the marching and fighting that they've been doing in the previous week. And so the end run becomes more of an end crawl. He makes it about 10 miles as far as Pleasant Valley Church on Route 50, which is still there today, and that's where they camp during the evening. On September the 1st, both armies continue to move across Fairfax County on a collision course. Alerted to Jackson's movements, Pope sends Joe Hooker's division to Germantown to protect the line of retreat, and then he sends two more divisions to intercept and delay the Confederates. And that's what you see happening here. So Pope finds out that Jackson is on the way, and so he sends a division under Joe Hooker to guard the critical intersection here, and then he sends two more divisions under Carney and Stevens to intercept Jackson. And this area right here is, is where the, the next battle, the largest battle fought in Fairfax County, is going to occur on the afternoon of the 1st of September. Fair Oaks Falls right here. The Battle of Ox Hill, or the Battle of Chantilly, is going to take place right here. Jimmy, you might be yeah. Ox Hill is today's West Ox. Ox Road? Ox Road. Yeah, right Road here. South, that's today's West Ox. So that road is here, the mall is right here. If you're going west on Route 50 and turn right here, that's West Knox Road. And a shopping center, a Fair Oaks Mall is where? Here. And where the X is, 
right behind Jackson. Ox Hill it used to be an Ox Hill. There used to be a hill there. It was shaved down. So there was an actual hill there on that corner where West Ox intersects with today's Route 50. And now that's uh, towards the Taj Mahal. And what's the uh, golf course there? Pender 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 Thank you. That's Penderwick Golf Course now. Right. It used to be called Pender. Thank you. All right, about 4.30 in the afternoon, it's been raining all day, and by about 4.30 in the afternoon, Major General Isaac Stevens launches his division against what turns out to be most of Jackson's entire wing. The steady rain turns into a violent thunderstorm. This is going to be the rainiest day of all of 1862 in Fairfax County, well over an inch of rain, and now they're fighting in that storm. Stevens attacks through the reed cornfield. The strong winds and the heavy rain make uh, rifles somewhat less than useful because the powder gets wet in many cases. And so there's uh, a lot of misfires and there, there's a lot of hand-to-hand -hand fighting with club muskets and bayonets in, the, in a driving rainstorm, you can imagine. When his line falters, Stevens grabs a flag and urges his men forward. As he is crossing a split rail fence, Stevens is shot in the temple, which kills him instantly. As Stevens' division retreats, Major General Phil Kearney leads his division forward onto the battlefield, renewing the attack through the cornfield. The violent storm and the corn make visibility very difficult, and uh, frustrated and ignoring the warnings of his own troops that there are Confederates on the other side of the corn, Kearney rides forward on his own to reconnoiter and runs right into a brigade of Georgians. They're from the Confederate side. <laughs> uh, he wheels his horse around, hoping that he hasn't been recognized as a federal officer, and ignores the orders to retreat. And as he is riding away, he's shot off of his horse and killed. He falls within a few yards of where Stevens had been killed less than an hour earlier. No general officer was killed at the Battle of Second Manassas, and now here in this battle in just down the road from us, you have two Union, off, Union generals killed within less than an hour of each other. By about 6.30, exhausted and low on ammunition, both sides disengage. The two hour long fight, as I said, the largest in Fairfax County of the Civil War, is a stalemate, but it results in another 1,100 casualties. Here you see modern day pictures of the very, very small park that does exist. There's not much left of the battlefield, but there is an Ox Hill, you can see from the sign. Uh, another one of those battles that has two names, either Chantilly or Ox Hill. The sign says Ox Hill here. Yes? How large an area was involved? Because the park is quite small. Um, I don't know, Jim, do you know? Probably 500 acres, maybe, something like that, actually involved in the valley. It, it, extended, it, it extended well into the area that would be now considered to be part of Fair Oaks Mall, as well as down Monument Drive toward um, the Fairfax County Parkway. It really was from 29 to 11, which um, what we've been talking about here, Northern Turnpike, all the way into Camp Washington. Where West Ox Road runs into 29 to 11, yep. all the way over to Route 50. Remember, it was also down towards German down Camp Washington. All in this area here. So it was a pretty big uh, area. Definitely the entire area of Fairfax Small. Many artifacts found there? Oh, yeah. When they were, yeah. There is no museum there, um, but those would, be, um, those would be in possession of uh, Fairfax County. <coughs> yeah. If I may. Was the infantry thinking at the time just to crash large numbers of men into other large numbers of men and see who won? See who killed it more than the other? Sounds idiotic, doesn't it? But yes, if you couldn't hear that, the, the, tac the infantry tactic was still based on, te on, te on, on tactics based on older weapons technology. When weapons with the effective range uh, of a musket, for instance, was 50 to 75 yards. Now you have rifled muskets with effective ranges out to 300 yards but they're still using the same mass infantry attack strategy. In other words, just mass a bunch of men together and march them up to the enemy and shoot, shoot fire away. Um, yes? How much artillery coverage was involved in this battle 
not, not a great deal of artillery, partly because of the visibility and partly because of the violent storm that was going on. It, it probably rivaled what we experienced here last you know, earlier in the month. It was that bad. Jimmy, one more thing. Uh, your red marker uh, on the picture on the left, go beyond the second uh, grade there. Those are the graves of the two generals. Of the two generals. Go beyond it and to the rock, to the right. Come down to the right. Uh, right there, you know, to the right. One up. River up. Now, there's kind of a great right block there yeah. below it. To the right. Uh, I haven't got a bad angle. Right there, that's where Stevens was killed. Oh. It's still there. That's the rock. And they have the historical pictures there on the uh, Civil War markers. It may be Cranny, I'm sorry. Uh, that's exactly where he fell. And they have a very small part of the cornfield that they that they plant uh, that's back in this area back here. Okay, let's move on to talk a little bit about what the war, what, what it felt like to be in Fairfax County during this time. Um, well, first of all, Lee's still not giving up on the idea of getting around the Union Army and preventing it from getting all the way back into, um, into Washington. And so Lee and Longstreet arrive on the battlefield as this Battle of Chantilly is ending. It's mostly Jackson's wing that's participated in the fighting on the Confederate side. Longstreet's further behind, coming down Route 50, but he's not going to get in there in time to participate in the fighting. But Lee arrives on the battlefield. It's still raining. He, he realizes that his infantry has been blocked from getting to the intersection. But he sends Jeb Stewart on a ride to try to get around and get into the rear of the Union division that's, that's protecting that intersection of the two roads. And the route that they took, you can follow today. Jim and I did it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it goes, he, he turned left um, on present day West Ox Road and goes to uh, where the, uh, the water towers are today, and then takes a right on the Waples Bill, which then turns into uh, the Oakton Road here, then up to the hill. And as Stewart's cavalry gets up to the top of the hill, we, he runs into the 1st Minnesota and the 19th Massachusetts and a couple of artillery pieces placed right in the middle of the road. That the, the Union troops have been placed there to prevent just this kind of an end run from happening getting around the end of the, uh, the Union division guarding the intersection. And the artillery is placed in the middle of the road and the two infantry units, regiments, are deployed on either side of the road in a V formation. So Stewart's cavalry is gonna ride right into the middle of all this. And there isn't much of a fight there, but they decide against trying to take on that much <laughs> artillery and infantry and they quickly retreat. And then Lee spends the night in the Germantown area. However, what's interesting is that neighborhood where that fight took place is called Oakton Crest, and you can visit it today. And one of the street signs uh, in this area, I don't know whether you can see it there or not, is called V Lane. Now, could that be the V formation of the Union troops? Who knows? Some developer with a sense of history, maybe. <laughs> Yes, we Southerners have lots of cousins. Well, the second battle of Manassas and the battle of Ox Hill or Chantilly resulted in 25,000 casualties. Figures are never exact for casualties during the Civil War, but Pope lost probably about 16,000, including quite a few who were captured. Lee suffered uh, 9,000 of his own. Local civilians had now seen a major battle and its horrendous effects including the discovery along the roads and even in some of their backyards of shallow graves. Many homes and churches are used as hospitals to care for the 13,000 wounded. About 3,000 Union wounded are evacuated south along the Ox Road, Route 123, to Fairfax Station because there's a railroad link there. They are too sick to be moved on the railroad and so they are treated some of them by Claire Barton. In the St. Saint, Saint Mary's Church, which continues to exist today, which is turned into a hospital. 
And then eventually, when they were well enough, they were put on the railroad and evacuated from Fairfax Station into Alexandria. Falls Church and Fairfax Courthouse also are swamped with wounded. And many local women put aside their political loyalties to act as nurses in makeshift battle uh, hospitals in the area. Major Richard Morey, the 24th Virginia, observed the area that we live in now, and what it looked like in 1862, and he wrote this. The most melancholy spectacle that one can imagine meets the eye here. Houses dismantled and torn to pieces. Gardens ruined and trampled down. Fences torn away. Orchards destroyed. And indeed, all marks of civilization and culture lost. Such is one of the many curses and horrors of war. Retreating Union soldiers often stopped long enough to take whatever they wanted from local civilians, regardless of their loyalties. They ransacked Reuben Ives' Falls Church home, taking furniture, bedding, blankets, even his clock. They killed and carried off his hogs as well. In Fairfax, they stripped the interior of Lewis Crump's house. They killed his hog and his chickens, and then they cooked and ate the animals in his ruined kitchen. Now, of uh, somewhat more positive interest to those of us in Reston is the next brief story. On Sunrise Valley Drive, just east of its intersection with Fairfax Parkway, is an office known as Hanger Prosthetics. It was started just after the Civil War by a Confederate veteran by the name of James Edward Hanger, who was the first documented amputee of the Civil War. His Civil War career lasted exactly one day. When he returned to his hometown in Virginia, he was a Virginian, he was determined to walk again, but he couldn't find a prosthetic leg that worked for him. So he made his own. He took a whittled barrel stave barrel staves and put a hinge at the knee. It worked so well that the Virginia State Legislature commissioned him to manufacture the hanger limb for other Civil War wounded veterans. Mr. Hanger patented the prosthetic device.